welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining today's uh, town hall, which I believe is number seven by the uh, Minister Lisa McLeod in doing these. But today's focus is going to be on Northern Ontario and Northern tourism issues. I think we would all agree on this call, whether you're a mom and pop shop, a large operator, you're working for an association or a municipality, that tourism, culture, heritage and sports sectors were hit probably the hardest by the COVID-19 crisis. We're seeing some progress, a long way to go. And Mr. McLeod has delivered big time on a lot of the funds and programs to help us get on the path forward. But in all of that, no doubt that Northern Ontario has been hit particularly hard. So that was the goal of the minister's focus today, uh, along with her counterpart, Minister Greg Rickford. I, I'm Tim Hudak. I'm CEO of the Ontario Real Estate Association. So I have the pleasure of uh, serving Ontario's 80,000 realtors across the north and across uh, our province. I'm also really excited because I did in the past have the chance to serve as both the Minister of Tourism, Culture, Recreation, and at one point in time, the Minister of Northern Development and mine. So I'm really excited to be on this call because the issues are always near and dear to my heart. But more importantly, we have now my uh, younger and much more talented successors in Lisa McLeod, our Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism, and Culture, and Minister Greg Rickford, Ontario's Minister of Energy, Mines, Northern Development, and Indigenous Affairs. By the way, I think the ministers are the longest titles in cabinet and greatest areas of responsibility across four ministries each. All right, so we're going to talk about COVID 19. A specific focus on the North and Northern uh, Ontario. Minister McLeod in these town halls has heard from you directly. She went to bat for you and as a result had a significant increase uh, in funds for tourism marketing assistance, regulatory uh, relief, and other actions to help us get on a path forward and help get people moving again. And since we last talked, Minister McLeod herself has been traveling around the province, uh, leading the way and getting people out and about to our great attractions and celebrating our great heritage and beauty of this province. So folks, again, as you heard, hit number three. We will line you up to ask questions uh, live to the ministers by hitting, again, number three on your phone. Please do keep your questions and comments to Northern Ontario, Northern Tourism. Minister McLeod will be hosting an additional electronic town hall very soon with some exciting new news to announce. So stay tuned for that. Today is on Northern Ontario. Okay, so we'll go to Minister McLeod first and then Minister Greg Rickford right after that. Minister McLeod, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tim, and uh, we're really excited that you were able to join us again uh, for our seventh telephone town hall and appreciate, uh, you know, your work as a previous minister in both of these portfolios. And uh, obviously, I'm grateful that you continue to uh, follow the developments within our suite of sectors that have been hit in the economy. I'm delighted that one of my good friends from the cabinet, uh, Greg Rickford, who is the Minister of uh, Northern Development and Mines um, and responsible for the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation, could be with us today. Uh, Greg Greg is probably our most experienced cabinet minister uh, and someone who really sees the long game that we're playing here. Um, he has, uh, in my opinion, been very ferocious in, in um, defending uh, the people of Northern Ontario as, as well as the sectors that uh, he represents. In addition, I found him to be very uh, helpful to me as we've navigated this storm. He, uh, like you, Tim, have, has already gone through a crisis um, in the economy, you, when you were a minister here uh, dealing with 9-11, and of course, Minister Rickford dealt with um, the, the last big recession that we had when he was in the federal cabinet. I think, though, we would all agree that this is a different uh, kettle of fish. This has cut longer and deeper than any crisis uh, any government in recent memory would would uh, expect to see, um, given that we are dealing with the, the, the worst global pandemic in our country's history. Um, as you all know, I, I say this, and I think it's bear, it, it bears reporting, or it bears repeating. Uh, this ministry has a dual mandate, and that is to support a spectacular double bottom line of the cultural fabric um, and the social impact of this province. And I'm delighted to say that the, the sectors that we support um, are the second largest volunteer sector in the entire country, and I think that's worth noting. In addition. Pre-COVID-19, we represented about $75 billion in economic activity, and we have seen as months go on um, that that has dwindled and that we are going to have to deal with a very long recovery. And we know it will, uh, if, if I say that we were hit first and hardest, we will be the sectors that will take the longest to recover, uh, simply because, as we all know, um, the ministries, uh, industry partners and sectors are those where people congregate. Uh, they're uh, very socially minded. 
And uh, obviously, with the spread of COVID-19, that can uh, take a, a toll. Um, we've been able to engage with everyone over seven telephone town halls, uh, this being the seventh, dedicated, as Mr. Hudak said, uh, to uh, Northern Ontario. Um, that's because I've had the opportunity to travel across Ontario in phase two, and I have not been able to uh, get to to, our, to the Northern, on, Northern Ontario uh, communities, uh, but that will come, and we are working uh, together right now uh, to make that happen happen when it's safe to do so. Um, since uh, we've spoken, uh, we've had 260 deputants at the Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs, um, first for the tourism and hospitality sectors, and then second for the culture, sport, and heritage sectors to, to look at what the impact of COVID-19 has been on the social side of things as well as the economy. Um, as you know, I say that we have been dealing with a triple threat, first and foremost, the public health crisis. Secondly, the economic crisis that has ensued. And third and finally, the social impact that this has had as, as on the crisis. And so I'm, I've been uh, obviously touring across the province to uh, make sure that people see that when we opened in phase two in different parts of the province, that it is safe to uh, take in some of our cultural and tourism attractions. It's safe to stay in a hotel. Um, it, it's safe to go on a local patio. Uh, in addition, the ministry has invested $13 million dollars uh, for uh, hyper-local uh, marketing uh, to support our tourism regions. And uh, today I'm pleased that uh, I will be making a further announcement of $18 million to Northern Ontario. Uh, the breakdown will be as such. The RTO funding uh, for 12 and 13 will be $5 million. The Ontario Arts Council will be investing $274,000 uh, into the north. The Ontario Trillium Foundation will be investing $8.2 million into Northern Ontario. Uh, I will be investing uh, $350,000 into the RTO3's marketing uh, budget and Indigenous Tourism Ontario will receive $100,000 to support marketing efforts as well. Um, through Celebrate Ontario, we are going to continue funding 27 festivals, though, though they are not able to uh, proceed, and that will come at, in, at about $316,000. The Ontario Cultural Attractions Fund is investing $245,000 into events in the north that may not uh, proceed, and uh, through uh, other ministry investments, um, such as at, at uh, um, Fort William Historical Society, we will be investing $4.5 million. So in total, uh, the ministry will flow $18 million to support um, the uh, the double bottom line that this ministry expects. So uh, again, I'm going to continue to uh, travel uh, across Ontario. I wrap up uh, phase two this week, and my hope is when we move into phase three, I'll be able to visit the north over a, a period of a week. In addition, I am working with the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing on tourism in our border communities, and we'll have more to say about that as we move forward. Uh, we are going to uh, continue to work with our ministerial advisory committees as we look at what the impacts of moving into phase three will be for our sectors. And I'll continue also to do uh, market research within the ministry and share that with those ministerial advisory committees so we can get a sense on what consumer behaviors and sentiments will be um, in terms of whether or not that's con that will be restricting um, hyper-tourism, um, hyper-local tourism, I should say. Um, 2021 will be a marquee year for us, and so I've instructed the ministry to start planning uh, for a calendar year that will include Ontarians moving around uh, freely when, when it is safe to do so, and we will be looking at targeted investments at that time in order to support festivals and events um, and, and people coming together and gathering once again. Uh, again, I think that as we move forward, um, the best I can do to support uh, you is, is, is through these marketing dollars as well as uh, through other targeted investments that we're making. Um, as the, the interprovincial borders start to reopen and those restrictions are eased, we'll be looking at more uh, domestic staycations around Canada and we'll, we'll shift marketing dollars that way. And then finally, uh, we expect air travel uh, to get back to normal around 2022 to 2023. And at that time, we will have a full-scale uh, marketing campaign internationally. Uh, I know many on this call are wondering what will happen with the provincial borders and, and, and our international borders. And these are matters that we continue to work on with the Premier of, of, of our province and 
Premier Ford, um, as well as with our federal counterparts. Uh, and I know that these have been especially difficult times for many of the people on this phone phone call. And I, I would really like just to say thank you um, for your patience and your dedication at this time. So again, today's announcements uh, amount to $18 million in program and uh, marketing money. Uh, through a variety of different funding sources and envelopes within the ministry, uh, a commitment to work with the Municipal Affairs Minister uh, on, on a border city so that we can look at how we can best uh, keep, the, keep those communities safe, uh, but at the same time uh, focus on supporting tourism. And then, of course, the marketing uh, side of things where we will um, support local communities uh, in, in, in making sure that there's hyper-local tourism. Uh, with that, uh, I'm delighted that my colleague, Minister Rickford, has joined us on this call today. He has done amazing work work in Indigenous Affairs and Northern Development of Mines, um, not to mention the great work he does as Minister of Energy. And I'm, I'm really happy that he's here. Uh, he has provided me with a, a great deal of guidance and advice over the past number of months. I'm, I'm entirely grateful to him and just very glad that he's on the call. So uh, with that, Tim, I'll pass it over to, to you and, uh, and Minister Rickford. Yeah, uh, terrific. Uh, thanks so much, Mr. McLeod. And, and thanks also for two of the things there, particularly your commitment to travel across Northern Ontario very soon, and also the specific breakdown in some of the funds that you secured through Cabinet and what that will mean to Northern communities and Indigenous communities. Great to hear those specifics. All right, so next up, uh, folks, an introduction. And again, if you want to ask a question to Minister McLeod and or Minister Rickford, please hit three on your phone. We do have a number of pre-submitted questions I will get to, but we do enjoy live questions about Northern Ontario, Northern tourism. Please hit three on your phones. Of course, no stranger to the vast majority of this audience, the Minister of Energy, Mines, Northern Development, and Indigenous Affairs. Greg Rickford also represents the Kenora Rainy River Riding, a resident of the Kenora area who served both as a nurse and a lawyer in remote First Nation communities and then served honorably federally, including being the Minister of Natural Resources and the Minister responsible for the Federal Economic Development Initiative for Northern Ontario. So he knows of what he speaks. Minister Rickford, welcome to the call, and please give some opening remarks to our audience. Well, thanks, Tim. <clears throat> nice to hear your voice, and, and thank you, Lisa, for those uh, kind words. Um, I want to thank everybody uh, who's on this call here today. Uh, many of you have um, uh, been in several different fora over the past couple of months, either directly with with me as the chairman of the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund and some of the consultations that we've done there, uh, our, our Northern Ministerial Advisory Council for the Jobs and, and Recovery Committee. Um, has spent a significant amount of time engaging specifically uh, tourism in in Northern Ontario, um, and and of course uh, our Indigenous Business Advisory Council. So there's been lots of consultation. There's no no shortage of engagement. I know some of our folks from Science North, for example, spoke directly uh, with me in a conference call, and we've had um, uh, dozens of fora that we've we've had a chance to. To hammer out the issue. So, in, in speaking with Lisa as recently as a couple of days ago, in preparation for this call, um, uh, we realized that g given the, the quality and caliber of people that are on this call, the fact that many of you have, frankly, consulted and advised um, uh, substantially, um, we, we are now in the process of winding up a lot of our advisory council work and making our submissions to the Minister of Finance. And as Elise, Lisa alluded to, um, starting to put ourselves into a position where we make some announceables. And I think it's high time, frankly, and there couldn't be anybody uh, more well positioned given the extensive consultations that Lisa has done uh, for tourism, culture and heritage across the province um, to lead that charge. In my capacity, obviously, uh, well invested in the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund, we stand at a more, in a more nuanced position uh, as we draft and develop uh, a tranche in the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund focused on COVID recovery, of which uh, touches on, on some of the pieces that lease involves with. So to avoid redundancy and protecting taxpayers' dollars, making sure they're targeted and go where they need to go. Uh, we've done much of that work um, jointly. I should just close with one one final remark um, before we get to the most important segment, the questions and answers. And that is for people that are involved in tourist camp operators, um, I don't think there's a group out there that I've seen um, who, who have seen a more and felt a more devastating impact, particularly and primarily because 
uh, many of the the camp operators' clientele um, are American. And clearly, as time marches on, uh, that becomes a more distant and difficult prospect to consider. Um, So as part of what we're doing in the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund, we're looking at the kind of help that can, can, can help uh, make a difference. And we've certainly had um, many consultations with those operators. Um, I feel many of these folks are, are personal friends of mine long time. And um, frankly, it, it, some days it seems very difficult to see uh, just exactly what um, any level of government can do. So it's important that we continue to work with with tourist camp operators in particular, especially out in northwestern Ontario, a distinction I like to make sometimes when we talk about the vast region of northern Ontario um, and and endeavor to find solutions. So, Tim, I'm going to turn it over uh, to you, and, and I've got several of my staff's ears on this call to continue to take your, your, your information. Um, and, of course, you can always reach out to me. Many of you know how to get a hold of me. Uh, directly. Thanks. The terrific. Minister Rick for Mr. McLeod, thank you both for those uh, opening remarks and your heartfelt commitment to help turn things around for northern tourism operators and businesses and uh, municipalities. Uh, again, folks, please press three on your phone. We do enjoy having live callers to give their uh, feedback, ask questions directly to the minister. Minister McLeod has been incredibly transparent throughout these uh, seven uh, town halls. So here's your chance. Please do ask a question. Hit number three, and we will cue you up. So Minister Rickford had just talked about one one of the huge issues that no doubt has uh, hammered uh, northern Ontario uh, more so than the rest of the province, although coming from Niagara, we feel it too, but not anywhere near the extent, as the minister said, about uh, northern camps and uh, outfitters, and that's a closure of the U.S. border. So one of the questions, ministers, we did get submitted ahead of time was from uh, Jackie Hockness, and Jackie is from Rugby Lake Lodge in Rugby Township, and Jackie says, Uh, Due to northwestern Ontario's geographic location, we are totally dependent on USA visitation. The domestic market will not carry this industry. Is the provincial government working with the federal government on measures to facilitate the border opening? And what kind of time frame are we looking at? I can I can start with that, and if Greg wanted to add anything, Tim, then we could do that. Um, we have been working um, each week with our federal counterparts, uh, sometimes daily, depending on which minister I'm with. Uh, so I uh, I interact on a daily basis with the Minister of Heritage uh, on Heritage, Culture, and Sport, and then the Minister of Economic Development and Trade is responsible for tourism at a federal le- level. And so we are we are working with them weekly. Um, this is more of a matter that the Solicitor General and the Minister of Municipal Affairs uh, and Housing is working on with respect to uh, their counterparts. So I know those discussions are ongoing. I know that this has been a really um, difficult time because the land border between Canada and the United States remains closed. And I had the opportunity in the last little while to visit, uh, for example, Gananoque, Niagara Falls and Windsor all border communities as well. And that's why I felt it was necessary to reach out to our Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing uh, so that we could set up a table um, with mayors of those border communities to see how we can best uh, support them um, in tourism. And so we'll be making a further announcement about that, but I wanted you to know that that is absolutely happening. And I and I recognize as well, Minister Rickford has been uh, working extensively uh, with the um, northern op- operators. I mean, obviously you have the border with Manitoba in addition to um, what's happening with the um, with, with the uh, federal government um, at, the, at the international border. Uh, I myself come from Ottawa, so we have uh, two provincial borders, as, uh, provincial border uh, with Quebec, and then um, you know an hour away the federal border. So these are some very important questions, um, and so we're, we'll continue to have those conversations. And we have to, I think, to as I said with the marketing money that we are putting out is is to start really promoting hyper-local tourism at this time until it is safe to open the borders and until those interprovincial borders are eased. So we're continuing to have the conversations, uh, but we will always uh, continue to be guided by the Chief Medical Officer of Health of Ontario and of Canada as we uh, as we look to what uh, opening international borders look like. So I, I hope uh, that answers your question, Jackie, and I, I really do appreciate you taking the time and, uh, to raise it today. Yeah, I, I'm just going to chime in on this. Uh, Jackie, listen, um, I, I think at this juncture, um, it, 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 it behooves us to, to say a couple of important things that can help 
bring even more clarity to a situation that is is wreaking havoc on particularly uh, tourist camp operators. The border is shut down till July 21st, notwithstanding conversations between the Premier um, and the Prime Minister, some of which I've been involved with um, around what that might look like. The challenges we face are are very obvious to us. 52,000 positive cases yesterday in the United States. In Fort Francis, um, uh, 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 two Americans were allowed across to move to, as, as residents in Canada with a, with a summer residence, and they promised to go directly to their camp to quarantine for 14 days. They were spotted in at least half a dozen business locations in Fort Francis and turned the town uh, upside down, as the saying goes. They were subsequently fined a thousand dollars a piece. The approach the Americans have taken has been entirely less disciplined than the one we've been taking, and it's been painful to watch small businesses, particularly in the tourist sector and particularly camp operators in northwestern Ontario, uh, where a hundred ninety to a hundred percent of their clientele are Americans. Um, some of these businesses are going to face, if they haven't already, very serious challenges to survive. So the conversations that are taking place are actually trilateral. Some might say um, four parties to the extent that we continue to look at a number of Indigenous communities, particularly across northern Ontario from Thunder Bay to the Manitoba border, where there are several entry ports into the United States that traverse Treaty 3. Um, as much as they'd love their camps to open, um, it seems unlikely. I can't, from here, uh, from where I'm standing today, see that border open for that kind of tourism activity for a time to come. And when I've consulted with tourist camp operators, as disappointed as they are in that notion, what they really want and what we're really pushing uh, for in our conversations with the federal government is more clarity around the prospect and the guidelines for what it would open. In other words, if it's not going to be till fall, tell us now, why get till July 20th? So far, the federal government has demonstrated um, an inability to be clear far enough in advance to create the kind of certainty for some of the things that we as a province need to do. So I hate to be the bearer of bad news on this. A lot of it is out of our hands. But right now, um, the, the consultations and the push that I'm making and that Lisa is focused on very much is if, if it's not going to be open, give us more certainty as to when it could be open. People would rather know that it's probably not an option until the end of the summer and you can start to plan for that and we can leverage the money that Lisa's talking about for Hyper Ontario. This will not solve everything, but it'll give us a better opportunity to focus uh, how we can move people uh, around the province as opposed to depending on a U.S. border, which I would say at this point is highly unreliable in terms of a, a date anytime soon. Camp operators are asking for greater certainty. We'd rather have the federal government tell us it's a couple months out, and here's what it would look like when it opens. Thank you. All right. Thank you, uh, both ministers. Uh, straight talk. Sympathy at the same time. Appreciate the effort you're making on a really difficult issue that's really out of the hands of the provincial government, but nonetheless, you've been championing the northern businesses. Uh, next question I ask you is a pre-submitted. Again, folks, we'd love to have you ask a question directly to the ministers. Please press 3. Again, press 3 on your phone. Uh, to be on the call live. We have uh, over 300 on the call right now on Northern Issues and Tourism. Okay, so Ryan Land uh, from the Director of Education Northern Programs out of uh, Sudbury, uh, obviously anxious to get on with things. Northern numbers when it comes to COVID uh, incidents and deaths far, far below even rural southern Ontario. Ryan has a question on a lot of folks' minds. Will there be an opportunity to have smaller scale festivals and events outdoors in Northern Ontario this summer? With public health recommendations in place. Minister? Yeah, listen, Ryan, great question. And yes, um, so two things. One is when we move into phase three, we suspect that uh, we'll be able to have uh, larger gatherings than we do now. Um, that's not to say we will have uh, mass gatherings that uh, are in the hundreds, but uh, there will be opportunities. Uh, what I do find to be very interesting and I'm very excited about, uh, I'll be making an announcement soon with Ontario Place, is uh, this I idea of drive-in and drive-through concepts. So um, we we will be hosting uh, 
the largest of its kind on Canadian soil, uh, a film festival, an international film festival, on the 20th of July at Ontario Place. And so there are a numerous um, different ideas that are circulating across the province. And so we're encouraging people. Like the one great part of the, being the minister of this area, despite the fact that we've had the most significant challenges in the economy, is the creativity and ingenuity of the people within this ministry. So we're very excited to um, support efforts like that. As I mentioned, I've already flowed $9 million in festival funding. Um, I believe we've funded, uh, it says 27 here in uh, northern Ontario, uh, and, and they may be engaging in different types of uh, drive-in, drive-through entertainment, um, possibly going virtually. Um, that said, we will have more to say on festival funding as well uh, as we look to make uh, 2021 a, a key and marquee year. So very excited about, uh, about the possibilities that uh, we, we have uh, given the constraints and and um, and uh, obviously the situation that we're dealing with with respect to COVID-19, but I think that uh, my my um, ministry would be happy to work with with you uh, and others uh, if you're looking at uh, doing uh, some type of uh, festival or event that uh, meets uh, or exceeds public health recommendations and requirements, uh, which is obviously appropriate social distancing, hand sanitation. Um, wearing masks were required, and uh, and we have we have noticed in my tour anyway across Ontario over the past three weeks that people are respecting that. So I don't know if Greg, if you have anything else to add uh, that I might not know about, but um, certainly uh, from our perspective, uh, there has been some creative ways um, to move forward. Well, certainly, once we move out of the the, the big cities of northern Ontario, um, we start to talk about much smaller scale festivals. I'm thinking of Coney Fest on beautiful Coney Island on Lake of the Woods, um, and and there's a there's a there's a fit relatively easy capacity to to look at at how those congregates um, would operate in in stage three. I just want to remind everyone, everybody on the call, that one of the primary reasons that most of Northern Ontario, so that would be outside of Sudbury and, and Thunder Bay, principally. Um, had to adhere to uh, pre-regionalization, uh, the discipline, is because many Northern Ontario communities were compromised in their ability um, to deal with any level of outbreak. If you think of Kenora Rainy River as the size of the United Kingdom, and we have four uh, level two intensive care unit beds with ventilator capacity, very quickly you realize that a smaller number uh, uh, in an outbreak is still a big outbreak for um, for Northern Ontario. And there are regions across parts of Northern Ontario, across the region that that, that suffer, uh, that are in that position and would suffer miserably from much smaller scale outbreaks. That said, the pitch for regionalization um, was a, a shout out and a credit to the premier and his leadership, recognizing that the numbers were starting to show um, some serious contraction, if existence at all, uh, of, of of COVID statistically and ep- epidemiologically uh, speaking. So I think in, in, in the, the, the opportunity, since this is much of an issue based uh, d- the discussion, is is to move into to, to to stage three to let those numbers grow and to be able to serve some of the smaller festivals. Um, without much consequence, save and except for the things that Lisa said, which I think are going to be part of our lives uh, at least until a vaccine uh, comes along. So I'm quite hopeful. I know a number of, um, in Northwestern Ontario, a number of festivals have actually been cancelled, um, given the planning and the, the, the efforts that go into them. Um, but I do believe if if some organizers stay nimble at the prospect of of having short term notice uh, and the likelihood, hopefully, that we're in in stage three in the coming weeks, if that's possible, um, uh, many of those festivals um, can can onboard with different dates if they were to occur earlier in the season or maintain their dates. I just really want to be able to go to the Dryden Gun Show. Is the truth um, the middle of August? So I'm hopeful that that it's on. <laughs> now you're motivated. All right, we got these folks who have joined the uh, telephone uh, town hall here with the uh, ministers of well, first Lisa McLeod, the Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism, and Culture Industries, and Greg Rickford, the Minister of Energy, 
Minds, Northern Development, and Indigenous Affairs, a specialty telephone town hall about Northern issues and Northern tourism. If you want to participate live and ask questions, please hit number three on your phone. And I'm Tim Hudak, CEO of the Ontario Real Estate Association. All right, Minister McLeod, Mr. Rickford, we'll go to our first live caller. Uh, Bob is calling in, so Eric, let's key up Bob. And Bob, just let us know what town or city you're from and who you work for. Okay, um, I'm in Sault Ste. Marie right now, but normally I'd be uh, flying up north of the Sioux. I'm the uh, president of NOTO, and also I own uh, Garson's Flying Outpost, and I uh, would be flying at uh, White River, but due to circumstances, I'm uh, here in the Sioux right now. And uh, my question would be is, um, you know, realistically, where the border is now, and, and looking to the end, that it's not going to be much of a season for operators who rely on American gas. and uh, they have already got a deposit for their vacation this summer, and so we owe them a trip. So next year, there won't be that revenue generated over the winter to, to open. Um, so I'm wondering if there'll be any aid to operators who will be, you know, basically have spent the money to survive this year and uh, come next year when uh, they go to get another loan or, or Early on the, you know, survival, um, how how will the government be able to help us get started next year? And we'll certainly hope this is by and that we're all going to have better seasons. Uh, thanks you very are. much for that, Bob. Um, Greg, did you want to go first? Sure, Bob. And you've got a beautiful spot up there in Cabinacagamesis Lake. Um, and and. It's been interesting in consulting with with operators. As I said earlier, a lot of the discussion around U.S. the Canada U.S. border has been focused now, and I think it's shifting um, more seriously to a, a, an exercise in providing greater certainty so that we can actually arm our tourist camp operators with the kind of instruments that they'll need, whether they're loan instruments, loan grant instruments, upgrades to your camps support for some of your employees to do those upgrades um, and pre-position, obviously, uh, as well, uh, working with insurance companies to give uh, relief, relief. And we've recently been working with the Ministry of Natural Resources for emancipation from some of the, the fees for, for bear management and and, uh, um, and uh, minnow, minnow licenses and, and different things like that. It's, they're small fixtures for now, but I think that the, our ability to understand whether this is going to go deep into the season uh, for the tourist camp operators um, is, is critical for us to understand what we can do best for you. I think the difference between a, a mid to late summer opening with the prospect for fall uh, and a couple of hunts that would still be on and some great fishing is different from us being, re, you know, more realistic, perhaps, but still the prospect now of saying it's going to be open. Then, if the season is completely wiped out, then the scope and the scale of our interventions as governments is going to look and feel much different. So, I go back to the certainty that we're going to require uh, from the federal government, and and I can assure you that I've had those conversations uh, with uh, with the premier, and Lisa and I have. Uh, on this segment in particular, said this is an o overly reliant sector on the American tourists. There's no tourist like this um, in the profile. They are highly concentrated to specific regions with price points that work for everybody. And it's going to be very difficult to replace them, even with the hyper, hyper whatever uh, the, the, the names are for, for out, of, out of Lisa's ministry. They're very effective, but they don't capture... Uh, a replacement for this uh, for this audience. So um, that that's that's where we are as we speak. That's, that's a live response. Thanks, Bob. So yeah, and Bob, like thank you, Minister Rickford. I think that um, you know, Minister Rickford and I have had uh, long conversations over the last four months about uh, how how do we deal with with a lot of this. And I think it, he's you know correctly states we need to work with the federal government who has that type of liquidity. Um, and that type of business support that should come forward. Um, and then, of course, I think that it raises the whole other issue of insurance, but I also think it, it needs to be targeted. So um, I'll be very honest, and, and um, I think that uh, the American traveler 
Um, it, it's going to take, uh, it's not going to take months to come back. I think one of the things that I've been trying to say everywhere is just because we flick the switch and people can come back, uh, doesn't necessarily mean that. And I've seen it, uh, I've seen the data on it and then I've seen it also in practice. And so I think in terms of how we build out, um, that sector, uh, we are going to have to have a longer conversation over a longer period of time, uh, that, that helps, uh, you pivot. And that will, of course, take some money. It will also take, I think, I think um, us studying um, what we could do in terms of consumer behavior and getting uh, people uh, from Ontario uh, taking in, and, and I appreciate where Greg is coming from, that uh, there is no sort of profile uh, built in Ontario. Um, the reality, however, is when we're looking at uh, air travel, for example, not returning to Ontario and Canada uh, in 2019 levels until possibly 22, 23. Uh, that that I think we have to plan for, and uh, I don't think we'll we'll solve that this week. But I certainly think that the conversation has to be had, and how do we how do we pivot and redirect uh, given the new circumstances? And I really appreciate the the call, and I'm I'm hoping that when I get up there, Bob, I'll have the opportunity to meet you. All right, thanks for that call, Bob. And if you want to uh, ask a question, as uh, Bob did, make your case directly to the ministers and ask them a question, please hit number three on your phone, and we'll put you on live with Minister McLeod and Minister Rickford. All right, we're going to get a question here from Laura Brown uh, from uh, Science, you know, sort of uh, Wendy Hogarth. I'll go to that one instead. I can change the topic up a little bit, something that uh, will be a generalized issue across northern Ontario and much of the province, too. But Uh, a big issue in Northern Ontario, and that's uh, rural internet access. So Wendy Hogarth, the uh, head of the Muskoka Lakes Farm and Winery in Bala, Ontario, says access to high-speed internet continues to be a challenge in the north and rural areas, even more so now. Could you review for us how you're going to address access to high-speed internet for these communities? Greg, I don't know if you wanted to start, given that you live in a rural community and I live in a big city. So I've I've only been experiencing it as I've been on tour in the last three weeks. So did you want to start? Yeah, very briefly. Um, a lot of work has been has been done quite recently. Um, it, it was largely coincidental to the extent that it wasn't on purpose that I had announced at least eight new significant projects in through Northern Ontario Heritage Fund across Northern Ontario um, and and uh, another recent round of, of, of um, announcements from Minister Scott focused squarely on Northern Ontario. Um, and, and these will take us a long way to bring certain pockets across Northern Ontario um, uh, at par, if you will, with, with uh, larger town and city centres uh, in in Northern Ontario, but generally speaking, uh, it's still not at the caliber uh, or uh, uh, width, if you will, in this broadband nomenclature um, that that other people in in much larger city centres and, and regions of of Ontario, at the very least, are are um, uh, uh, have access to. So I've I've really focused my my discussions with Minister Scott uh, on. A pairing or a stacking with the federal government that looks at bringing, not treating us as rural broadband, actually, focusing on a strategy as we had done when I was in the federal government of bring us, bringing us all to a certain place and make that as a goal. Otherwise, what you get through the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund, which we plan to do less of, actually, for the reasons I'll discuss in a second, and even through the Ministry of Infrastructure. In the absence of stackable funding from the federal government, we build out our broadband by ad hoc, and we wind up with ongoing disparity. And then we see a pandemic like this really amplify, if you will, or demonstrate just exactly how uh, troubled or challenged our broadband is. So it's not my view, respectfully, um, that piecemeal funding from a smaller scale um, uh, foundation like NOHFC um, or even Infrastructure Ontario serves us that well if we're just doing project one-offs. Um, I think the future is a discussion, and it's it's happening now, in fact, about um, needing the, the opportunity um, for rural broadband to, to, to get it to a place where other city centres have and then move forward uh, collectively um, with, with the same capacity. Thank you. 
Yeah, and, and I would just add, um, in having seen this and, and looking at this, particularly in our sectors, uh, most uh, events having to go um, online and be virtual, such as what we've done with Ontario.live and musictogether.ca, um, it, in order to have that, uh, have those tools uh, as marketing tools for uh, tourism and culture later on down the road, it's going to be critical that uh, you have that access. So, um, there are governments putting forward a five-year broadband, broadband and cellular action plan, investing about $315 million, and the hope is to get 220,000 new homes um, and businesses connected uh, through that strategy. And so it, it's absolutely critical. And I think, uh, as Greg pointed out, um, it, it was it, by coincidence we'd already been working on this. So it, it's, it's wonderful that we're in a position to make that investment and, and to move forward. Um, but it is something, uh, you know, I, I didn't really realized living in a city of a million people, um, how bad it actually was out uh, in some communities. And um, particularly as we've been moving to telephone and uh, Zoom calls, it, uh, it, it has been a big challenge. So we certainly, uh, you know, understand that. And, and uh, the government is taking uh, measures in order to, uh, to alleviate that. All right, you're listening to a telephone town hall with Minister Lisa McLeod, Minister Greg Rickford. This is Minister McLeod's seventh of these telephone town halls, and she wanted to do one specific to Northern Ontario and Northern tourism, given the unique impact, sadly, that COVID has had on those communities and industries. And, of course, a great co-pilot to have, the Northern Minister himself, Greg Rickford. All right, I'm going to change it up a little bit to the world of sport, Minister. So Brett Lamming, the Director of Community Services at the City of Sault Ste. Marie, asks a simple question. When can municipalities open their indoor sports arena facilities? Uh, thanks very much, Tim. Um, obviously, in Stage 2, facilities for indoor sports and recreational um, fitness activities can open for use by a business or organization to train amateur or professional athletes um, or to run amateur or professional athletic competitions if they comply with, and I'll, I'll, I'll lay out the um, criteria, um, only people are allowed to use the facility if they are performing work for the business uh, and or clients. Uh, the person who enters must uh, maintain physical distance. Uh, at, that's at least two meters away from anyone using the facility. Uh, team sports can't be practiced or played within the facility at this time, uh, with the exception of training sessions for members of a sports team that uh, includes games or scrimmages. Um, activities that are likely to result in individuals coming within two meters of each other uh, can't be practiced at that time. Uh, no spectators are permitted at a facility other than up to one uh, parent um, for each child under the age of 18. And um, subject to the, uh, the emergency order, locker rooms, change rooms, showers, clubhouses uh, have to be closed except if they are to um, access equipment storage, uh, washroom, or a portion of the facility needs to be used for first aid. So uh, I think as we move forward to stage three, we'll start to see considerations by the Chief Medical Officer of Health to open gyms and indoor sports facilities, fitness facilities, uh, studios with public health measures in place uh, to to limit the number of people, floor space, equipment, showers, and change rooms. But these are all, again, uh, tough but yet necessary decisions. We have and and um, we have made some great strides as a province, and I think we're probably um, across the country the gold standard, uh, no pun intended, when it comes to um, to moving forward with sports. Uh, simply because we became the first jurisdiction in the country and one of the first uh, to ensure that our high-performance athletes were able to train. Those would be our nationally carded athletes or our Olympians. Uh, we were also uh, the first in the, in the country to uh, greenlight um, training and conditioning facilities for our pro sports. So we're starting to see that uh, open up, and, and we're starting to uh, make sure that the protocols are in place. So we'll have more to say about that as we uh, evolve into Stage 3, and, uh, and, and we will be having a dedicated um, telephone town hall uh, for uh, what stage three will look like um, within the ministry. And so we'll just stay tuned for that. I don't want to um, not completely answer the question, but there will be a more appropriate time for me to be able to provide a more wholesome and, and fulsome response. All right, terrific. Let's go to our next uh, live uh, caller. We, uh, we have your time. We have the minister's time until one o'clock. So we've got about seven and a half minutes here. So uh, Jim, uh, Eric, let's go ahead and queue up Jim, who has a question on hyper-tourism and reopening facilities with additional services. Jim, welcome to Mr. McLeod's Telephone Town Hall. Thank you very much. Um, 
to both ministers, but particularly to Lisa. Um, the uh, we were really encouraged when the North was uh, sort of uh, recognized as being much more successful in controls. Obviously, there's a lot less people, very much less people, um, for uh, distancing or in controls for COVID. And uh, but that's about I don't know five six weeks ago now, and there's been no no movement beyond, even though uh, among the the uh, health authorities, the uh, citizens, and the businesses, there's next to nothing that's happening as far as COVID goes. Um, I'm I'm in a big believer that no matter how no matter what we do, I like can see patios buzzing now and people moving all about. You can see. Stores that are uh, where people are jamming up at the specials, and it's just uh, it's it's like business as usual up outside. And I'm a big believer that if people don't practice and, and don't obey the rules, the basic rules of COVID, that we're doomed. So uh, that that comes back to the individual. And in my particular I, case, now we're we're really. Maybe- Jimmy, I make a great point here, and I just want to make sure we get as many questions as we can. So would you mind going ahead just asking your question directly? I think you've made a very good overall point. In this uh, hotel here, we uh, it's a large hotel. It's got – we can control people eating inside. We've got space. We've got vertical space, horizontal space. There's at least 12 feet between tables. And when you talk of hyper-tourism – I'm trying to understand what that means because we cannot deal with tourists that are coming through now. In other words, they they come here for a full service hotel, many other hotels like this, and you you cannot you can only serve and take out food. You can sell them a room. That's very nice, but you can't use pools. You can't use restaurants, and you are you are uh, going to lose hundreds of thousands of dollars this year if, if it goes as protected predicted. Not blaming government for that, but the fact is. We got staff that are starting to feel sick from other things like mental disease <laughs> rather than COVID. Why? When can we get open? Why, why can't we get open? Terrific, well, Jared, very, very well said. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. McLeod, please go ahead. Yeah, look, I, that's an excellent question. So let me address it this way. Um, first of all, Jim, you rightfully point out that it's going to be hard to get people moving again, which is why we're focusing on local tourism, getting Ontarians reconnected in some cases in their own community. Let me tell you why. I'm going to run through a few polling uh, results that we have in the ministry that I have uh, shared with my ministerial advisory committees. A stay in a hotel, somebody ready now or within the next two weeks, only 12% of Ontarians. Uh, For people to eat inside a restaurant, ready now or within the next two weeks, only 13% of Ontarians. Traveling by airplane, only 6% of Ontarians are comfortable doing that. Um, Going to a movie theater to see a show, only 7% of Ontarians today are comfortable doing those things, which is why um, when you look at the uh, marketing money that we're investing, the $13 million, and why I'm going on tour is to demonstrate that you can do these things safely when it's appropriate to do so. I know, for example, many of our hotels and resorts are operating under 10% capacity right now because people are, are nervous. And so we have done a good job as a province, uh, and I'm not just talking about the government, but as people, in telling people to social distance, self-isolate, wear a mask, wash your hands. Uh, we, we always say we're safer when we're apart. And so we've done a good job of that, which has prevented the spread of COVID-19. Now, according to our market research, and what I'm seeing on my tour, is, is it, it's going to take some time for consumer sentiment and habits to get back to pre-COVID-19 levels. In many cases, for some things, it will be a year or two, if ever again. So that's the big challenge. In terms of um, where we look at and when, when will more things be open, uh, Premier's been pretty clear we'll be, we'll be looking at that in phase three. Uh, Minister Rickford and I have been part of those discussions, and, and uh, you know we're very hopeful in, in two areas of the province, uh, him as a northern and myself as an eastern Ontarian. We have seen the decline, and uh, the residents doing their part uh, to start getting people back uh, in, involved. Now, just with respect to the hotel piece, I had I have a ministerial advisory committee 
on uh, hotels and hospitalities. Uh, they have been doing great work. I'm going to continue to engage them as we move into phase three. And just this morning, I had a, a fantastic call with the leadership at the Marriott Hotels of Canada in terms of what reco recovery planning would look like. And we have offered them uh, to be part of our advisory team and to work on um, how we have a safe return to stay, as well as a, a safe return to play in the province of Ontario. And that would also include marketing. And, and a big part of that marketing isn't just come here from you know United States or or India or China. Really, right now, it is demonstrating that safety protocols are in place in every single hotel and in every single restaurant and in every single tourism or cultural attraction in the province. Otherwise, they can open, and therefore that 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 safety um, and and the respect of physical distancing will allow um, those those businesses to operate. But we are. Given what the, the information that I have and that I like to share with all of you, uh, we're not out of the clear. Like I say, just because we're flicking the switch or just because we're opening the door doesn't mean that people are coming through it. So, Greg, I don't know if you wanted to add anything more to that. You and I have had these conversations over the last number of months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have. And, and just, just to, uh, to bring the point home again, um, and, and Lisa was a champion of, of, of this real uh, describing this in, in real terms uh, for the benefit of everyone, uh, given how dramatically the, her, her, her ministry was impacted by, by the pandemic. Even if you open the things you think should be opened, there are compelling statistics to, to suggest that people will still not come. Um, I think as time has marched on uh, and, and Lisa has articulated a behavioral modification experience that has to go on. And I have been uh, in my travels across mostly Northwestern Ontario state confined to the region said, you know, we are approaching a juncture to your point, uh, sir, about, about hotels where if those statistics are that compelling and it's to say that people won't come, then we have more latitude to open them because as we move into stage three, the biggest challenge is going to be to convince or persuade people that it's actually safe to come and do those. You're talking to a guy who, with great trepidation, just loaded his family up um, on an airplane uh, late last week to come down here to Toronto to do some outstanding um, uh, things since I'd been up in Northwest Ontario for a couple of months. Tra flying was surreal. You're talking about a guy here who has been uh, top tier status in Air Canada at least every year for the past decade and a half of his life. And I've never seen anything like this. Um, so empty airports and people looking like they're traveling to the moon in, in, the, in their outfits that they're wearing as opposed to a Winnipeg to Toronto flight. So there's still a lot of skepticism out there about the safety factor. Um, and I'm a believer that, that encouraging us to move into stage three given the low numbers that we have, in some cases it's non-existent, um, is, will allow us to focus on the real challenge, and that is to convince people that it's safe to do these things um, uh, moving forward. Thanks. All right, thank you both very much. Now, we have hit uh, 201, as a matter of fact. I appreciate uh, your contribution of time of those listening. Remember that Minister McLeod will be doing another province-wide telephone town hall with some exciting news coming up. Stay tuned. So let's now go to some concluding uh, remarks uh, here as we end the session. Again, thank you to both ministers for this specific telephone town hall to address the unique needs and concerns of Northern uh, Ontario. So go to Minister McLeod for Tim, some closing Tim, if I, if I could, if I could, maybe, maybe there was, I think there was a, a conversation, somebody from Science North, if I wasn't mistaken. I, I'm available for another question if if uh, if that person sure. from Science okay. North is yeah, on, because so they, they, they do I, I have a rather meeting. Thing. Sorry, guys, I have a meeting with the Lieutenant Governor, so it's, I will have to I'll have to depart because of. Do you uh, want to? Yeah, do you yeah. want to do some closing remarks, Mr. McLeod? Then I go to Minister Rickford right after. Uh, sure. Um, so I, I'll be. I'll thank you very much, and sorry that I do have to depart. Um, I have had a pre previously scheduled meeting with the LG because uh, I am also responsible for honors and awards, and and uh, obviously our honors and awards programming uh, this year has to be um, changed 
very dramatically. Um, look, I'll just I'll say thank you to Minister Rickford for um, ha, you know taking the time with us today. I know he's been doing a lot of work uh, with the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund and uh, working with all of you to see how we can best support you. Uh, my hope is that I'll be able to get up there for a, a week. Um, and uh, I, I will take uh, David McLaughlin up. Uh, he was going to do three or four days with me, but I think uh, just given everything, I'd like to spend a bit more time. Um, we're going to continue to work with you. As I said, we'll be having a, a more uh, ministry-wide, province-wide um, telephone town hall as, as the days and weeks uh, go on. And, and certainly, I believe, um, if all things being equal, it will be this week. Um, and, and we'll continue to figure out best ways to target investments into your community so that uh, in 18 months from now, when COVID-19 hopefully has a vaccine um, and, and hopefully a, a very viable treatment, that we can get back to some semblance of, of normalcy. And again, I just I, I point out and I say 18 months um, simply because I think that a year and a half from now, we have to look at what does Ontario, uh, what do we want Ontario to look like? My Ontario has libraries. It has art galleries. It has uh, children's programming. It has sports. Um, it has theaters. It 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 has what we used to have, but it might look slightly different. If we don't continue to invest the $18 million in the north the way we're doing it, that could all be in jeopardy. And I don't think anybody on this call wants that. And so we're going to continue to uh, target our, our funding in the best way we can so that not only will these important tourism and cultural attractions survive, uh, but in 18 months from now, they will be in a position to thrive and that we will also be in a position to welcome visitors from across Canada and hopefully, again, when it's safe to do so, from throughout the rest of the world. And we want to be in that position. And so that's why we're taking the decisions we are. Uh, Greg will, 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 I'm sure, agree. Every decision we have taken as a government and every decision we have taken within our own ministries have been tough yet necessary. Uh, and it wasn't easy. For example, um, when we had to shut down our 18 agencies and attractions, Science North being one of them on the 12th of March, uh, and and looking at uh, what that might do on, uh, prior to March break, which is a, a very busy week. Um, I think those we look back that the decisions that we took as a ministry with those 18 agencies and attractions were the right ones. And so, so with that, again, thank you very much. I do appreciate the opportunity today. I do look forward to seeing you all soon when it's safe to do so. And I look forward to having another telephone town hall later this week. And, and, and I do apologize to run off, but I, I do have, uh, I do have another uh, obligation. No, of course, Mr. Claude, thank you again for your extraordinary hard work and your success in helping out uh, industries across uh, your various ministry portfolios. Uh, we know you don't want to keep the Lieutenant Governor uh, waiting. So thank you. And we'll go to uh, Minister Rickford. The last question uh, I didn't get to here, but we'll ask you as maybe a part, uh, Minister, of your closing remarks uh, to respond to anything that you want to say in conclusion as we head past two o'clock. It was from Laura Brown. She is with Science North and Sudbury. And Laura asked, what type of marketing budget and campaign will be implemented for the North? And when will that go into the market? Minister. Yeah, so Lisa is probably better positioned to to answer that question. I, I think the response was uh, around 13 million, and as far as I'm aware, it, it's already underway. Um, but but my staff can can link. I don't think I've never known Science North to be short on its information about what the provincial government is up to. That's a that's a shout out to Guy Labine, and is an extraordinary term. Um, but but we we certainly uh, we certainly can help help uh, all stakeholders with that and sort of understand how that is going to be parsed out. I think uh, you know as I said we're in the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund. We've been sitting back and just taking a look at where the bigger ministries armed with larger resources um, shortfalls or gaps might be and how we can do some um, some uh, appropriate. Um, more focused and micro, if you if you will, hundred million dollars is no small amount of money. But when you look at the pressures that it are put on it year in and year out, um, uh, it isn't a resort to, a resource to be compared to some of the other ministries. Um, so so we'll look at more specific the use of more specific advertising uh, dollars in in but but with Science North and obviously more. Interesting. Obviously, I've heard from a lot of people already the, the disappointment of, 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 of the difficult decisions that you've had to make to cancel uh, a lot of in-person camps, given the uncertainty of when we hit certain regions. And I've asked 
uh, different uh, stages in regionalization. I've asked you to 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 keep the organization nimble in in, in the prospect of offering some camp opportunities for for students, um, perhaps. Uh, later in the summer, obviously in northwestern Ontario, the kids go back to school a little sooner than most. Um, but um, I, I'd sure like that opportunity to be made available up until the last minute. So hopefully that's the way it is. And terrific, Minister. We're wrapping up now. We've been past uh, two uh, p.m. I know you've got uh, important things to get onto as the folks do on this call. Anything that you want to say, conclusion as we end. Yeah, I just I, I think thematically, folks, uh, you know. We're hopeful, uh, especially in Northern Ontario, and, the, and, the, and the, the opportunity that I am pitching strenuously here in Toronto, literally, I'm down here uh, to do some in-person uh, meetings, obviously, with res- respecting all of the guidelines, um, are to, you know, to move the, the regions that went into stage two first into stage three sooner or later for the reasons that I discussed. And that was to understand what businesses would need what at policy options and resources to support them. Two, to bring behavioral modification to the forefront, giving people the confidence that these places are open. And at their own discretion and willingness, they would move into a, a place in their mind where they would they would try it out. I mean, it's as, as was mentioned earlier, patios. You know, were they would look pretty skinny at first, but more and more people were showing up. Turns out we like each other a lot more than than we thought we did. Um, so um, so so I'm hopeful that 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 conversation, which is which is happening right now, will bring to bear some fruit. Um, uh, hopefully in in mid Julyish or slightly thereafter, uh, and especially for Northern Ontario, so we can as I said earlier, understand what policy initiatives we should pursue for certain segments in, in tourism and, and culture and heritage um, and small businesses, more broadly speaking, and get people thinking back on track that 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 uh, where the communities they live in um, and the surrounding areas are safe places to be. And Terrific. Get, get out more. Terrific. Many thanks to Minister of Energy, Mines, Northern Development and Ditches, Paris Greg Rickford, for taking time for this telephone at Town Hall with an eye on Northern and Northern tourism issues. We appreciate how you've gone to bat for the folks uh, on this call and their colleagues uh, right across the province and all of us who are looking forward to getting back to Northern Ontario and celebrating the beauty and great heritage and historic attractions there. Folks, this will conclude uh, our call. Outstanding to have Minister McLeod continue to coordinate these Town Halls. Stay tuned. There will be another town hall coming up uh, shortly with more developments that are important uh, to you. We've had over 300 people on this northern specific call. I think probably hit over 5,000 in all the calls the minister has done to date. Thank you for joining today's call. And the ministry is pleased to respond to any additional questions they've received and help inform their communications going forward. We look forward to hearing from you next time. Thank you again to everyone for joining us. If you still have any questions or any feedback that you would like to share with Minister McLeod and the ministry, you can do so by emailing minister.mcleod at ontario.ca. Just a reminder, you can email questions and feedback to us at minister.mcleod at ontario.ca. Thank you again and have a good afternoon.